coffee. Coffee now! <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim Powers and Artemis, for hosting this event and having the space. And I also want to thank uh, uh, Rachel, Rachel Ehrenfeld of the American Center for Democracy, whose idea was originally to have this have this meeting. It wouldn't have happened without her. I'm. Uh, I would like to introduce our our, our main speaker here, uh, Ambassador R. James Woolsey, who's a former director of the CIA and was the director of the CIA. Uh, when I was there, in fact, I went through several CIA directors. In my opinion, he was the best. <laughs> he was definitely the best. Yeah, actually met with the front troops and uh, and cared more deeply, I think, about that job than any uh, anyone else who was there. And the uh, ambassador, Henry Cooper, hardly needs any introduction, had been the director of the Strategic Defense Initiative under President Reagan, you know, an engineering background under President Bush, I stand corrected. Uh, you know, headed up high frontier and has taken on trying to protect this country against the existential threat from electromagnetic pulse as a personal mission and has been looking at it not just at a national level but going to the states. I myself, you know, most of you probably don't know, know me. I'm Dr. Peter Vincent Fry. I uh, worked in the CIA on this issue. Uh, uh, you know, I've spent most of my professional career working on electromagnetic pulse and weapons of mass destruction. Then I went on to the House Armed Services Committee served on the Congressional EMP Commission, you know, that labored on this for a decade and pro pro produced a blueprint for protecting the country that has still not been implemented. Now I'm the executive director of a task force on national and homeland security, Congressional Advisory Board. Our goal is to try to get the country protected on an accelerated basis. With those comments, Jim, if you would like to well, take it away. Well, thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. I'm sorry to be late. Uh, I, I went to 10 G Street Northwest, which is some distance, uh, uh, from here. but leading my wife on similar occasions to say, Director of Central what? Uh, um, this problem started out more than a century ago um, when uh, Tesla, for very good reasons, and Westinghouse defeated uh, Edison and GE. And we ended up with an alternating current grid that lets one transmit from a much smaller number of generating stations than we would have needed if we'd gone with direct current, with a relatively limited number of generating stations, let one, beginning in the late 19th century, uh, transmit electricity by stepping up with transformers, stringing wires, stepping down with transformers, transmit electricity for substantial distances. Uh, had we uh, gone with Edison's plan, uh, we would have had small coal-fired generators all over every city in the United States. So Tesla won for good and sufficient reason then. Uh, as time has gone on, from the beginnings of the, the electric grid in the 1880s until today, we have essentially had two times in which Americans began to really fear and take cognizance of their infrastructure and worry that uh, something might happen to it. I'd say, and after December 7th, 1941, that spirit worrying about German and Japanese submarines off the shore and so forth probably lasted three or four, five months. Uh, by then, we were pretty clear that we controlled the seas around us and beyond. Uh, and I'm sure some people began to worry about infrastructure on 9-11, but for most people it didn't last very long. So since we have 18 critical infrastructures in the U.S., water, food, etc., and the other 17 depend to one degree or another on electricity, the fact that our electric grid uh, is alternating current Transformers being the heart of the system, two to three thousand of them in, in North America, in the United States, um, has created a situation uh, where we were in perfect shape to make 
some other mistakes. And the other mistakes that we made, giving due allowance to the brilliance of the engineers who put together uh, the electric grid, it is amazing. It's a nationwide system, probably the largest machine in the world in a sense. Most of the time, you need to plug in a light. You can plug in a light and you get electricity. It's a just-in-time system. For all practical purposes, you're producing the electricity at the same time you use it, so you've got to make constant adjustments. But in good times, it works. And so those two blips on the screen after Pearl Harbor and after 9-11 probably didn't do enough to agitate anyone to try to take another look at the way the electric grid was constructed or any of the assumptions behind it. And as we come up uh, into the 1990s, uh, two things uh, happened. First of all, uh, the web began to come into existence and people began to rely on it more and more. Now the web was put together by a handful of geniuses, almost all of them part of my flower child uh, generation. And for at least some of them, the idea was share. There is nothing that can go wrong if you share. The world is like a kindergarten sandbox. <laughs> if we just learn to share, everything will be fine. And we began to share. And some people, a uh, 19 year old private first class who decided, a teenager, decided he would give millions of classified cables to WikiLeaks and on and on. Lots of people shared. And uh, uh, it was. Uh, a potential problem, but nothing manifested itself right away. And along about the same time, sort of late 90s instead of early 90s, we decided we also ought to decontrol and the electric grid so that if you could buy from Tulsa, Oklahoma, electricity more cheaply by half a cent a kilowatt hour in Maine than in Washington state, then buy it from Washington State. Exchanges would pop up, everybody would, things would work, and they did. All of this, in a sense, works. But it was put together with this wild dance of buying and selling electricity all over the country simultaneously, producing while you use, relying for the heart of the matter on, on a two or 3,000 pieces of equipment, very easily damaged and protected by a cyclone fence only, virtually every place they are located. Uh, even at nuclear power stations, the transformers are normally not protected any better than transformers are any place else. The nuclear materials are in the nuclear station, but the electricity is, in most cases, not all, but in most cases, outside. So we have a situation where we put this all together essentially without anyone giving a single thought to security. There has been virtually no attention to security of even the, the most basic types. For example, a few years ago, out here at PJM, the exchange East Coast for a number of states, um, a gentleman showed up from China. And um, he uh, said that he was looking into the way electric grids worked, and he wondered if he could look into the files and the plans and so forth for PJM. And PJM, I don't know, they called the State Department. Somebody at the State Department said, oh, well, he's Chinese. We want to be nice to the Chinese. Sure, let him have a look. Sure. And some months later, uh, someone in the federal government finally heard about this and decided to call him and see what was going on. They got him on the phone. He spoke very good English. Um, Chinese intelligence officers often do. Uh, and he uh, said that, uh, uh, yeah, he was uh, nearly through with his work. And uh, they said, would you like to come in and share with us what you were doing? We can talk to you about what, you know, we're all working on electric grids. He said, sure, I'd be glad to be in. Day after tomorrow, OK? And they said, yeah, day after tomorrow's fine. And uh, uh, the next day, he flew to Beijing. What did he take? What did he learn? Was he a sophisticated engineer? 
not? Who knows? We'll never know. But whether it is putting cyclone fences and nothing more around transformers, which if they are taken down, a handful of them can knock out a major section of the country, and they take well over a year to construct, and they're built in South Korea and Northern Europe. Whether it is that kind of inattention to security, or sure, if you're Chinese, we like Chinese, come look at our grid plans. Whatever it is, this country is not well served by the way the electric grid is protected or by the people who are doing it. Now, it is not their fault, the fault of the individual engineers and the others who are only given a specific task, figure out where to put the cyclone fence, and so they put it the best place they can. It's not their fault. In a sense, it's all of ours uh, because there is virtually no structure to the electricity grid's management. The Department of Energy, as nearly as I can tell, has a small, competent, very small staff, and they do some studies. Uh, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission has more substantial responsibilities. They regulate transmission and its long-range transmission and its, and its cost. Uh, they nominally have some kind of authority for, for uh, some aspects of security, but probably in the statutes, they're pretty murky. You would say that most of the security is in the hands of NERC, the North American Electricity Reliability Corporation. And NERC is essentially a, a trade organization of some 3,500 utilities. Uh, a footnote. When the Founding Fathers put together the American Constitution that hot summer in Philadelphia, uh, they had as their model the Roman Republic's Constitution, not Empire, Republic. And they knew one thing had gone terribly wrong with the Roman Republic, and that was how to control the military. Much of the rest was pretty good, and it worked kind of like our Constitution. But controlling the military, that's what came apart, that led Caesar, Bruce, all of that. So when the Founding Fathers were putting our Constitution together, they said, that we've got to fix. And they fixed it pretty well. We have a president who's the commander in chief. We have a Congress that approves the money. And those are the only players. And you can't choose up sides in the Congress and appropriate only for your favorite general and the way the Romans did and so forth. You got it. It's a pretty good system that, that we've got. Uh, but we have one commander in chief. So although sometimes we mess up, we've at least got a chance of having a structure that defines an objective and figures out how to deal with fighting a war. We are at war now with those who want to take down our electricity grid. And we have 3,500 generals, all equal. That would be the utilities in the United States, who are kind of sort of in charge of it a little bit, maybe. The deputy director of ARPA-E, the energy side of ARPA, told me a few weeks ago that he had crunched these numbers himself and that the 3,500 utilities in the United States spend less annually on research and development than does the American dog food industry. Now, we have pretty healthy dogs in the U.S. You know, and all of us like our dogs. But perhaps the technology of improving and protecting the grid has a somewhat higher priority than it is, is being given. So we are in a situation where we have never really, oh, oh, by the way, there are other players in the electricity business. Probably the most powerful entities are the public service commissions, uh, uh, public utility commissions of which there are 50 in the country, and they make decisions from time to time about things electrical. One of the big things they don't want is added pennies per month on consumers' electric bills because then they vote them out of office or get mad at them or write op-eds or whatever. 
So they are very, very careful not to let any increase in price come about and of electricity. And what that means is that virtually nothing gets spent on security. So we have a structure of the grid and those things that are need, need to be done in order to protect it that uh, is almost entirely dysfunctional. Uh, nobody is really in charge of security for the grid and no single intelligence with a staff that is planning how to deal with these threats as they come up is in place. They don't exist. Um, Consequently, as vulnerabilities come about because people take fresh looks at technology or they learn something that other countries are doing in an area of technology, um, we are not in a position to respond really at all, much less promptly. And uh, that uh, creates some very serious problems. People have begun to, to pay more and more attention to the vulnerability of the transformers because, as I said, the large ones take a long time to produce and aren't made in this country. And the utilities have very, very few spares of the two to 3,000 um, transformers. We probably have 5% replacement spares and max, and those uh, uh, are for the large transformers, those replacements and the transformer itself are extremely large, extremely heavy. And to ship some of them, you have to take roads apart and bridges apart and, and on and on and on. They are Homeland Security and in Department of Energy are working on a new set of far more easily transportable transformers, but they're not the very large ones that are, are the heart uh, of the system. Uh, so as dangers to transformers come about, even physical attack, rifles, uh, people are not equipped to deal with it. And as new technologies, more uh, sophisticated than rifles, uh, come about, um, much of what one tries to present to government officials and the rest is met by kind of a blank stare. Now, uh, one of the most important uh, of these is electromagnetic pulse. It has been around for as long as the sun has been around, so it's been around a very long time. And every 100 or 200 years, a huge electromagnetic pulse from the sun, a so-called Carrington event, um, can uh, have a massive effect on the electromagnetic sphere of the Earth. Uh, smaller electromagnetic pulses uh, or uh, uh, ejections from from the sun can also cause uh, uh, extraordinary uh, uh, problems. Uh, one uh, in Quebec uh, a few years ago, Peter Pry will remember how 1989, 1989 uh, was uh, so powerful uh, that it, it caused many billions of dollars of uh, damage uh, in Canada. And the last Peter and I uh, looked at it, I think, a recent uh, report from, um, from Lloyd's of London suggests that if that event, instead of having been focused on Quebec, were at a place on the sun that it was focused on the Boston-Washington corridor, it would have done or would do today, just initially, just the very first shock, something between uh, 600 billion and 2.6 trillion? Uh, not that much. Uh, 600, uh, it's at 0.06. Yeah, in the, uh, in, the, in the hundreds of billions of dollars, you know. Of say, say in the hundreds of billions of dollars of, of, of damage, more, more than in, in Quebec. Um, that um, um, doesn't even account for, as far as I can tell, things like uh, uh, the electric uh, grid going down so farmers' tractors don't work, so trying to figure out how to grow food for all of us. Uh, we have about 2% of the American population growing food. We used to take 40, 50% to feed the rest of us. Now it takes 2%. 
if none of their electrical gear works, try to imagine what irrigates the vegetables in the Central Valley of California or anything else. Uh, uh, an electromagnetic pulse can be devastating uh, to, uh, to the, the, the grid. And it is uh, uh, not something that has to be or necessarily will be likely to be uh, carried out by an adversary. It can be carried out uh, by the sun. We've worried about it being carried out by an adversary for some time. And so we had the presidential aircraft and strategic air command commander's aircraft and a few key nodes in our capacity to retaliate against the Soviets with nuclear weapons that were protected uh, from electromagnetic pulse by the way the, the, the equipment was produced, um, but very little. And uh, the problem with that is that with a pulse that is, de is generated by the detonation of a nuclear weapon, uh, one could uh, lose uh, the country's uh, uh, grid, uh, mainly by losing the transformers, although also each uh, uh, individual piece of electronic equipment that was within the right range and area would, uh, would be taken out as, uh, as well. Uh, so uh, that set of problems is in a way more troubling than the possession by a country like North Korea or Iran of nuclear weapons and uh, ballistic missiles um, that are designed to attack a specific target. Because it's very hard to attack a specific target with a ballistic missile. You have to re-enter, you have to have accuracy, so forth. But if all you have to do is detonate while it's in orbit, you launch it into orbit and it detonates, uh, you could uh, uh, well uh, have a very substantial share of the U.S. Uh, go down from the uh, EMP. There's three electromagnetic pulse types. I'll let Peter tell you about them. But one is of not no great consequence. One affects directly instruments such as your car's ignition. Uh, and others, the other, the third. Uh, uh, mainly travels along the, the transmission lines and affects the, the grid and the transformers. Um, but we um, uh, are not well equipped to figure out how to assess dangers that may come about to the grid and take precautionary steps uh, to deal with them. I, uh, there are a few members of Congress, there are a few people in the country who have spoken out on this issue and uh, tried to figure out how we could uh, begin to get our arms uh, around it. But we are behind. Uh, on the combative side of EMP, we're behind the, uh, the, the, the Russians and the Chinese and uh, quite possibly even the North Koreans, since they have relatively little electronic gear to protect. I think uh, uh, I would uh, close with that by way of, of introduction uh, and just say I know there are people here in the, in the audience who know a good deal more about EMP than I do, and we certainly ought to let them speak. I wanted to try to set an overall context uh, for the discussion, if I could, and uh, it, is, uh, it is not a pleasing uh, milieu within which to try to begin to work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Peter, so much. over to you. Well, over to um, Pastor to Cooper. Me? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> just a comment or two to supplement what you said, Jim. Um, as I understand it, I, and I meant to look this up after last week's discussion, uh, we had a near miss of a solar uh, emission within the last uh, several months, is it? Yeah, I think so. Which uh, went by us in the orbit of the Earth, that if it hit us was bigger than the Canadian event by far. And, and what Michael said, it was the size of the Carrington event of 1859. So uh, we missed that. We're still in the, uh, uh, in the window of uh, solar maxima and will be, I suppose, for the rest of this year. Yes. Peter can talk more about that. Um, the other thing I want to compliment what you said uh, with an E, uh, and, and an I for that <laughs> matter. Um, 
I think when I first met you, I was worrying about the survivability of our strategic systems and right. um, and trying to figure out how uh, we would deal with a serious attack by the Soviet Union. And um, not long after that, I had the oversight responsibilities for the programs that dealt with EMP. And, and there are some people who want to say that EMP is a figment of a bunch of technical guys and their, um, and their imagination, and I can assure you it isn't that way. Um, 1962, there was a high-altitude test called Starfish Prime in the South Pacific that caused damage in Hawaii some eight or 900 miles away, I believe it was. And we were surprised by that. And I can tell you because I also oversaw the underground test programs and so on, EMP was more than an annoyance on the instrumentation, on, even on underground tests years later. Uh, we spent a fair amount of money during the Cold War uh, hardening our strategic systems to electromagnetic pulse, and surely we would not have done that if it were an imaginary thing. Admiral uh, Monroe oversaw the programs um, at the Defense Nuclear Agency that dealt with all of these effects. Spent a lot of money, spent a lot of time, not only how to harden them, but how to maintain systems so that they were not um, didn't lose the hardness that we built in, designed and built in. We found problems even when you had good designs, things weren't built the way they were supposed to be, and even after you built them the way they were supposed to be built, they weren't maintained on occasion uh, to assure the hardening. And without a serious testing maintenance program, you don't have confidence that you can deal with these problems. And this is an electromagnetic pulse uh, created by nuclear weapons, as uh, Jim said. Uh, and there are three components. One of them is lightning. Everybody knows what lightning is. You have surge arresters or whatever to deal with with that effect. One is the low frequency, long wavelength pulse, which is the same as what you get from the sun. And then there's a very high frequency, short wavelength pulse, which causes damage to uh, solid state electronics of all sort. And um, they, all three of those effects can be problems. The high and the low end are the, are the main ones that create the issue. In the case of the grid um, and the sun, the solar, it, it's the long wavelength pulse that creates the problem. And I want to say that, uh, you know, I'm going to talk to you briefly about missile defense here in a little bit. Um, missile defense doesn't protect you from the sun's problem. So, Dealing with the electric power grid is something you have to have there. The second thing I'd say about missile defense is there's nothing that I know of that man's ever produced that's perfect. So defenses don't always work, and if they don't work, it's wise to have some other hardening in the system to, to assure that you can reconstruct whatever it was that was damaged. When a nuclear weapon goes off, a couple hundred miles above the United States, no one gets hurt immediately. Um, the lights go out, uh, and everything that's powered by the grid goes out. Um, and that includes a whole host of things you might think about and some things you might not think about. I mean, water, you lose water. Uh, you lose the power for your sewage. Imagine being in a you know, 100-story building or whatever, and gravity takes over. And um, how, 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 how you manage life and any more. I don't know whether you can open these windows here or not. You don't have air conditioning. You don't have all the neat things that we've come to rely upon. And you have chaos uh, pretty quickly. And that's where people die uh, if we aren't prepared. Um, Bill Fortune, who I think was going to join us in this uh, conversation, wrote a book um, called One Second After where he hypothesized what life would be like in the little town he lives in, in Black Rock, is it, or something like that, North, North Carolina. Carolina, over in the Smokies. And it's, uh, it, it, it creates some really problematic uh, issues, even when you have food and water for your own people to survive. The cities have great problems, and a massive migration by foot or whatever 
it's hard to hard to imagine but get your head wrapped around but it's a uh, it's problem and and we could use more i think serious discussion with the um, the population on that nature uh, on that problem um, and what what the consequences would be now i want to talk a little bit about missile defense uh, that's what i spent a lot of my life worrying about for the last um, decade or so several decades actually and um, we worried initially about the threat from the soviet union we worried more recently about threats out of North Korea and Iran, eventually with nuclear armed missiles, and um, and not the massive attack that we had before, but even one or two. Uh, generally, until recently, we didn't worry about EMP being coupled to that. And frankly, I didn't get spun up on this issue until about six or eight months ago, when I learned for the first time that Congress was blocking um, dealing with the electric power grid. I didn't think anybody in their right mind would just accept this kind of vulnerability, and that's when I got all spun up to deal with the issue. When I started looking into it, uh, I realized that, you know, all of our efforts um, ever since missile defense became a serious subject in the 60s, and I, Bell Labs worked on Nike Zeus and Spartan and Sprint and, and those nuclear-armed systems and, and, and making sure <laughs> that we could deal with our own weapons going off and with the issue of salvage fusing and all that became a major problem in the design of our own weapon systems way back then. Um, but as I uh, thought about this issue, uh, came to realize that, you know, we postured ourselves for the Soviets attacking us over the North Pole. And so we've deployed our um, interceptors, Originally, we were going to build just a site up in North Korea. Actually, originally, we were going to build a number North of Dakota. sites. And North then Dakota. we had a trader. North Dakota. Right. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> They're not there yet. They're not there. Uh, and, uh, um, and, and we built a site, and it was operational for six months, I believe, before we shut it down. But everything was postured to deal with an attack over the North Pole, and it still is. Um, the sy systems that we're deploying in Alaska and and California are, are vectored toward dealing primarily with the North Korean threat. Uh, at least the Alaskan site would have a shot at uh, Iranian launches over the North Pole uh, if they weren't going too far south along the East Coast. But it's, uh, it's not, uh, we don't have a lot of confidence in that capability. And so we need, need something to go with what we have. Um, the uh, Aegis, Navy's uh, Aegis system, ballistic missile defense system, in my judgment, is the most capable defense we have today. It has an excellent test record, um, and it has been operated since day one by the operational crews. They're not dedicated on these ships to defending the country against ballistic missiles. They have other missions, but they carry defensive interceptors wherever they go. And uh, when they are in the neighborhood of the United States along the East Coast, let's say, they have the inherent capability of shooting down ICBMs from Iran. I say they have the inherent capability uh, because we haven't given them the de facto capability. In order to have that, they need a radar up in the northeastern part of the United States, say in Maine. And the radar doesn't have to be all that uh, sophisticated. It's basically what's referred to now as a TIPI-2 radar. It's the, essentially the same radar, X-band radar, that is deployed with our THAAD uh, theater missile defense programs. But with a cue from that, a ship off the coast of uh, northern Virginia, say at Norfolk or wherever, could defend the eastern seaboard uh, between Washington and New York. If you put another radar in um, around Camp Lejeune, you can defend the southern part of the United States. And that's with the Aegis systems that's uh, deployed today. We're, we're, if you keep up with these programs, you know we're going to be building ground-based uh, Aegis sites in uh, Romania and in um, uh, Poland. The Romanian site goes in in 2000 and 
15, I believe it is, and the site in Poland in 2017. Um, and when we get to the Poland site, we'll have a faster interceptor, which would be more capable if you put that on a ship as well. Uh, and it will fit in the vertical launch tube, or at least if we continue with the program we have going now, it would. It could. Con it could defend uh, the entire eastern seaboard with a single radar up north. And I passed out these pictures, and you can find in them um, some sketches in the back of what what our current capabilities are for just what's deployed today and what's already in the budget funded and will be deployed overseas anyway. Um, uh, within the next um, three to five years. And I, I, I said they were on ships, but if you put them on the shore, of course, they can work there too. So if you could put an Aegis Assure site at Fort Dix, then it's there all the time and could provide. And that's in Delaware, I think. New Jersey. New Jersey. New Jersey. Christy would like that, well, I suppose. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> Anyway, uh, uh, that could protect the, the northeastern seaboard uh, reasonably quickly. But the ships will do the job. And whenever I talk about this, there's always somebody that raises the issue of picket ships. They say, well, the Navy is never going to like the idea of, you know, having to patrol the coast and, and serve as a picket ship. What they don't appreciate is that there are ships on our coast all the time. Uh, last year, on an average day, picked at random, there were two ships along the eastern seaboard. And there were three to six more that were either in port or they were being modified. Now, I haven't sat down with the operations types. Maybe Bob could help with this. But uh, I don't think it takes a genius to figure out have an ad, how to have an ad hoc defense capability with just what is naturally occurring along our eastern coast all the time. But we have to plan to do it, and you have to uh, train to do it, and so on. Hank, could I add one thing about why this is so important? Hank said everything's designed to come over the pole at us, and we're defending over the pole. Right. With a fractional orbital bombardment system, which the Soviets invented and which we had too, uh, you could launch to the south, come around the south pole, and detonate an EMP shot above the United States without ever having passed within the path of the radars and defense systems. Now, it doesn't mean they couldn't be reorganized to point south in part. That's, right. I mean, Hanks just told you basically how to do that. But it hadn't been done. So you are, today, you have a vulnerability to the t type of threat that he's describing coming around the South Pole without uh, uh, any uh, uh, even detection, much less uh, uh, Defense. Excuse you're, me. You're a great state, straight man. That's where I was going next. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. I mentioned that we were dealing with the attack from the north. And it's not only uh, a hypothetical that this could be done, as, as Jim said. The Russians did it and, uh, and I guess could do it again because they, were, they uh, ceased and desisted as, a, as part of the deal, I think, on the SALT to agreement, which was never ratified. And um, so there, there isn't even a legal constraint that holds them back. Um, but more than that, you don't need the fancy system that they were building. You just put the, the bomb on a satellite. And both China, uh, both um, uh, uh, North Korea and Iran in the last year have launched satellites over the South Pole, or nearly over the South Pole. They can certainly revector so that they come over the South Pole. And on their very uh, initial flight over the United States, detonate, say, over Omaha, somewhere there. And you could possibly take down the entire grid. Um, we have no defense against that. We don't even have a radar system that would see it coming. Uh, another picture that's in here, thanks to Peter Busey, um, and he can describe it in more detail, shows the radar fans that that have evolved from the Cold War radars, and it's hard to see because, but there's a gap in the, to the south. We got lots of radars looking north and to the east and the west, but we're wide open uh, to the south for our, the main warning radars that we have. And the optimum place to put that would be in the um, Panama City area of Florida. 
Eglin Air Force Base, Tyndall Air Force Base are major test ranges for the Air Force and the Navy, and it would, wouldn't take up much room to have a site there. So it, again, it doesn't take a genius to fill the gaps, but you have to plan to do it, you have to program to do it, you have to man it and train it. Um, and the, the final thing I want to talk about is another one that's a bewildering thing to me. And uh, you serve not only on the EMP Commission, Jim, as I recall, you served on the Missile Defense Threat Commission as well with Don Rumsfeld. And 1998, as a part of that, it was identified that you don't need ICBMs or even long-range satellites or anything like that to attack the United States. You can put a rocket on a ship. And it was that. designed to empower the U.S. Federal Energy Regulatory Commission so it could protect the grid, give it the powers it needs to protect the grid, just the way the Federal Aviation Administration, for example, has the power to tell the airline industry, you can't fly airplanes if they've got cracks in the wings, okay? You know, same thing here, you know, to give to give FERC that kind of an, uh, uh, authority so that it, it will uh, make a level playing field for all all of the 1,500 utilities so that they all have to do the same thing so nobody gets any kind of a competitive advantage. Everybody has to be equally responsible in, ta in taking the relatively low-cost measures that are necessary. But they must do it. Right now, they're not doing it voluntarily, and nobody in the government has the authority to tell them to do it. That's why the SHIELD Act is absolutely necessary. The SHIELD Act is the successor to the GRID Act. Now that the Republicans try to uh, control the House, they have... Basically, it's the, the GRID Act, you know, the Republican version of it, very similar. Uh, uh, you, know, uh, 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 you know, there are some minor differences between the bills, but they are essentially the same bill, and they both have enjoyed very strong bipartisan support. But they haven't been able to get the bill through the House Energy and Commerce Committee, you know, which uh, has very friendly relationships with, guess who, the NERC, the North American Electrical Liability Corporation. And that has been the problem, one of the problems. So... Getting the SHIELD Act passed is one emergency thing that probably should be done as soon as possible. You know, between the GRID Act and the SHIELD Act, I'd say, well, let's see, when did they start? 2009 is when Congress first started trying to pass bills like that. 2009. And here it is, 2013, and we still haven't been able to get it through. And we've got North Korean freighters showing up with nuclear capable missiles in the Caribbean. You know, the, uh, yeah. the, the other thing we need to do is... The, how, the Department of Homeland Security, you know, should implement a new national planning scenario focused on EMP. This was a core recommendation of the EMP Commission made back in 2008. You know, these national planning scenarios are the basis for all federal, state, and local emergency planning, and training, and resource allocation. Even if you can't get the SHIELD Act passed, at least if you had the national planning scenario focused on EMP, it would be an enormous step we're getting the whole country protected. Let's let uh, let's let people uh, raise issues with us. We've talked well, let me, at you let me for a while. Right, one last one last thing. One last thing, and then I will shut up and open it to questions. The last thing is is uh, you know we have to give enormous credit to the state of Maine. I hope the whole country follows the example of Andrea Boland, state representative from the state of Maine, who heroically, back in February, introduced a bill called LD131 to the Maine State Legislature. And, you know she's a liberal Democrat from the state of Maine who said. We're tired of waiting for Washington, you know, uh, you know, geomagnetic storms, nuclear MP, non-nuclear MP, these pose a mortal threat to the people of the state of Maine. And, and it took her, it took her exactly, let's see, from February to, uh, to June, it took a few months for the state of Maine, you know, to actually pass LD-131. They are the first state in the United States who passed a bill. They're not waiting for Washington. They're going to move forward and protect their grid. And that's an example of Washington will not act and the state should act to protect their people. Absolutely. So I apologize for taking one, so long. One of the one of the wry things about all this is that in the book one second after that Hank mentioned, and uh, in uh, NBC's uh, uh, series Revolution, the central theme is the United right. States after the grid goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so Hollywood and uh, late night TV and novelists are. Well ahead of the government of the United States on uh, this matter. Yeah. Bob, shoot. Uh, yeah, I'd like to amplify one point very quickly that uh, Jim and Peter made. Uh, I'd like to talk about the aspect the, that there 
there are really two aspects of the EMP threat. One is the threat to the military systems. One is threat to the civilian systems. Now, the, uh, I, as Hank said, I worked in the 70s uh, on the military systems. Uh, we spent hundreds of millions of dollars a year uh, conducting underground nuclear tests to, to expose weapon systems to the EMP fluids of, of these weapons. We developed simulators to that you could, uh, uh, without conducting an actual nuclear explosion, uh, expose aircraft, ships, and larger weapon systems to, in fact, I'm sure many in the, or several at least in the room, uh, participated in this. Uh, my first underground nuclear test was high Gold in 1977, the first one I managed at. And I don't know if you, if all of you are aware that the Nevada test site was regarded as where DOE did tests to design new weapons. Well, DOD, in the form of the Defense Nuclear Agency, ran its own separate tests at a different location in Nevada. I did, and DNA then was the national lab for studying nuclear weapon effects. Um, what's your question? This, so the point was that the military side, as as Peter just mentioned, has been very active in this and knows just what to do. The civilian side, as all three of these gentlemen have said. Think about the civilian side for just one minute. Nobody's in charge. There are thousands of individual, individual utilities, and as Jim said, they're trying to reduce the cost of a kilowatt hour of electricity by every means possible. <coughs> Nobody is going to do this uh, if they don't have to. So. Just, uh, I never thought I'd say these words, but having spent the last half of my life, I'm in my 80s, uh, on this issue of EMP, the only way I can see to do it is to create a government agency that has the power to protect America from the civilian American electric grid from EMP. Thanks. I just want to point out that this is uh, Vice Admiral Robert Monroe who ran, that was the director of the Defense Nuclear Agency responsible for protecting U.S. military forces. He should have been on this panel if I had organized it. Excuse me. Hank, you're going to say something first? That's or? right. Go ahead, please. A question. You're, when you're looking for two part, looking for a federal authority to force the utilities to do First question would be, how much does it cost for a medium utility, say, with a million meters, a million customers, to do the right thing? Second question is, have you taken, I would assume you've made this presentation to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, because of all people, I mean, they don't want station blackout. In the wake of Fukushima, loss of off-site power, every civilian nuclear plant has diesel generators, but you run out of diesel. Pretty fast. Right. It's always assumed that the off-site power will be restored and the on-site diesel generators are a temporary thing. Yeah. This, a general EMP would have Fukushima's all over the country. Yes, Popping absolutely. every week. Yeah. And I guess the third question, in terms of the imposition of regulation, the 2005 Energy Policy Act converted what used to be the voluntary NERC from a reliability council of utilities to the reliability corporation. Right. And don't they have the, the authority congressionally to impose reliability standards? So there let me turn, is the let me problem. turn to you <laughs> first, but kind of, sort of. And the yeah, last they, time yes. I looked at uh, okay, their so. record, for voluntary uh, rules, uh, the average time it took them to get them out was, I think, six months or two. So, But once they got into anything that had any teeth in it, and they had to proceed by consensus, so everybody chimes in again and again and again. The average time 
from initiating the procedure to completing a rule was three years and eight months. And what's interesting about three years and eight months is that is the length of the time the United States was in World War II. <laughs> Sounds like a bureaucracy. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was going to uh, comment about the NRC as well. Uh, I, I ha I'm hopeful that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission will take this seriously. Uh, in the first place, uh, there are a number of commissioners, past and present, who know something about this problem. A lot of former submarine uh, officers of one form or another uh, were familiar with nuclear matters generally, and while they were doing their, their bit um, with SB, they were learning about nuclear weapons effects of the sort we're talking about here as well. So I don't think there's a problem in teaching them about this issue. And in the wake of uh, uh, the Japanese uh, problem a while back, for the reasons you mentioned, I think they're sensitive to the issue. Um, so that's one pocket where there's real competence, and I think uh, they have authorities to act separately from other places in the government because of the nuclear yeah. the N word, if you will, and it's been that way uh, since the beginning. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I, I believe that there is a possibility of seeing a positive change in the Department of Energy. Uh, two things, uh, uh, Ernie's, Ernest Moniz, PhD physicist from MIT, some of us conspired to get a question on his agenda during the confirmation hearing, and he answered, uh, in what I consider to be a positive way. We asked him, uh, Senator Murkowski, who is the ranking member, asked uh, if he was planning to uh, un understand the EMP issues and the power grid issues. And in his response, he basically said he needed to learn more about that. But yes, he wanted to worry about the entire resiliency of the grid. To come back to your point, uh, Jim, which would include EMP, but all the other okay. vulnerabilities, potential vulnerabilities to the grid as well. And um, he, he, in his essence, said he was going to deal with both the man-made and nuclear yeah. threats. Let's try so to get I some. There's a real chance. Some, quest some questions. Some questions out, and if people try to limit your questions to one question, and responders, wherever in the room, up here or not in the room, try to limit your answers to something brief. So I go ahead. Regarding the DHS, why? What? Where is? The, what is the status now of them putting that on as a national planning scenario? And secondly, in the write-up that you uh, gave us today, in preparation for this meeting, you talked about the DHS cutting back on monies for training of, of, of the utilities. Can you elaborate? On that? I, I met with some of them the other day about this uh, vulnerability from uh, rifle fire that, that Peter talked about in. Uh, California. I think they're seriously getting involved in that and seeing what they can do about it. Um, I, I don't know about your first question. Uh, Hank, National Peter. planning scenarios. Yeah. Well, the, I, I know that they have uh, they have been looking at draft scenarios and considering the possibility. And I know, but given the amount of pressure that's coming from Congress, I'm I'm not going to say that I'm hopeful they're actually going to adopt such a uh, su such a scenario. Uh, uh, but at least they're moving into the right direction. Back in September of last year, an excellent briefing was given by DHS where they acknowledged the threat, uh, acknowledged they had responsibility for it, and I know that was followed by letters from Congress asking them again to to uh, uh, to come up with a national planning scenario for any EMP. Bureaucracies move slowly. You know, maybe we'll be pleasantly surprised. I did want to add one thing, and this very crucial question was asked by this other gentleman about the cost. You know what is it going? Uh, what are what are the costs? And I think we need to address that. There's, the commission estimated, you know, that that the whole uh, national electric grid could be protected for a cost of two billion dollars, which is what we give to uh, Pakistan every year in foreign aid. Uh, you know, no, that's everything. Uh, that's everything. Robust protection that would include uh, include non-nuclear uh, uh, as well. Uh, that estimate has actually come down as vendors who specialize in this kind of protection have looked at it so that there are estimates now on the order of 500 million and the US Federal Energy Regulatory Commission estimated that doing making this protection would cost the average ratepayer an annual increase in their electric bill of 20 cents annually mm -hmm. so it's a very affordable kind of a thing money isn't the reason uh, uh, or or shouldn't be the excuse for not doing
mean anything. Further questions from down the table here? Do we have? Yes. I mean, there were people at the state level who knew this way to Oklahoma who were concerned about this issue. What do you do in the name of the people who at the state level know what they Good question. You, you, you were on top of the main issue more yeah, than Yeah, sure. A, 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 a legislature who cares about the issue could introduce an initiative, and it could be similar or identical to the initiative LD-131 that was put forward in Maine. Uh, you know, and uh, and ba and I would. There's usually committees that deal with energy. You know, uh, it matters. That was what they started with in the state of Maine. You know, uh, it was the. Uh, in, in their case, they have a joint House Senate committee on energy that basically deals with the utilities and the regulatory committee. Uh, and they started off being very skeptical because they hadn't even heard the DMP before and didn't know anything about it. But we had. Uh, including Ambassador Woolsey, Ambassador Cooper, you know, uh, we had a, a parade of experts who did understand this and impressed upon them how important this was, and uh, it kind of restores your faith in democracy after our long frustration here in Washington to see that it only took a matter of a few months for, for the legislatures in the state of Maine to do the right thing. And, and what they did was they ended up uh, 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 pa passing the bill which uh, uh, would launch a plan you know, to protect the main grid, to protect the main grid. And uh, uh, I think the next step after that, when they examine the plans and the uh, alternative costs of those plans, they're going to go forward. From the with, yeah, right. Further. Yes. I just, uh, two quick sentences and then a question. Uh, uh, when I was serving in the Air Force, there was a radar in Texas that was called South Loop. So it did exist. Okay. Uh, so we can't fix that problem. Uh, the other statement is uh, I'm concerned about solution set that was proposed by the SM3s is uh, that a uh, ship off of any part of the coast could launch that in that range would be impossible to prevent. Uh, but uh, the question I have is how do we, how, can we for example build resiliency or sustainability for example having systems shut down but when after an event turn on and then there's a backup system. Oh. Is there, what are the solutions build redundancy, resilience, sustainability, in case the EMP protection doesn't work? Good question. Hank? On the, on the SM3, the, uh, you know, it's a kinematic issue where you are located versus where the, the launch point is. And of the interceptors that we have, we've, it has demonstrated an ability to hit an ascent phase, both short, medium, and intermediate range. But it, has to be, it has to be. but it has to be near where they're being launched. That's why I said I want uh, four sites around the Gulf of Mexico. That that gives you an idea of where, right. you know, what the what the separation has to but be. Does it have that to be could reduce to something on the order of two when the higher velocity interceptors are available. Peter That's, asked if they have to be deployed at sea. Can it be maybe ashore, Aegis ashore? It could be, an Aegis, it could be Aegis ashore or Aegis at sea. My point to you earlier was we have ships there now. And uh, we're not using them. Now, you know, maybe they wouldn't give you perfect defense, but it's better than no defense. Right. Okay. You had a question? Yeah. Uh, why Maine? Because um, they took the initiative. Are you guys organized to go in if you get any instance, if you are the generator in the state, do you guys go in and, and brief like legislators? Why don't you talk about? Meeting in Atlanta. Th this is a pickup team so yeah. far here. Yeah. Well, my, my, that's, my, a good, that's a good my task, my task force, which includes Cindy Ayers, who's sitting across from you, you know, we are we are willing to do that. You know, we will go anywhere to any state to try to help. And uh, uh, Maine, part of the reason was because of that person. I mean, Andrea Boland just happened to know about EMP. And uh, another thing that I think that a lot of them found compelling about it is that Maine is right across the street. I mean, their neighbor is uh, Eastern Canada, which is where the 1989 Hydro-Quebec storm hit. Uh, and in fact, they were affected by, by some of that too, as well as part of the Northeast blackout. So Maine was no stranger to, uh, you know, to, these, uh, to these threats and to the consequences of blackouts. In fact, they had had, a serious, they had a serious blackout just from snowstorms that had occurred that winter. And, uh, uh, you know, and so that raised people's consciousness about the, the the idea of a protracted blackout that could last weeks, months, or, or years. I, I was asked in the congressional testimony, I 
did a short while back whether NERC was positioned to deal with the full range of outages. And I said, I thought probably tree branches were a little too much for them, but they could probably handle the squirrels. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can, but, I lost power for a week in El Barreto last yeah. year. I know exactly yeah, what we did too. Before you go, leave this, Peter, talk about the Atlanta meeting. Yes, we're, there's going to be a meeting uh, in uh, uh, beginning on 11 August of the National Council of State Legislatures. And, uh, uh, you know, our EMP coalition uh, is going to be, uh, have a substantial presence there to appeal to the states to educate including them. Including Andrea. Yeah, including Andrea. Andrea Boland, in fact, is leading our delegation down there to appeal to the states to educate them on this threat and to encourage them to undertake state initiatives as a uh, as a way of supplementing or, or as an alternative means if Washington fails to act on this. You know, the people should know and the states should have the uh, option at least of, of, of knowing that other states are taking initiatives. And there are other states, by the way, that are already uh, moving in this direction. I know uh, North Carolina is very interested in, in taking initiatives. Uh, as is Texas, uh, Alaska, uh, was one of the first states under Sarah Palin. They actually passed a bill to the state legislature calling upon the Department of Homeland Security to work with Alaska and Utah. So uh, uh, some states are already aware of this threat and are, uh, and are, are, are moving on their own to act uh, to protect their people. We've got a few more minutes. Yes. Uh, I have a question given the obvious difficulty of getting things happening in Washington. And then we have, for example, the growing uh, developing smart grid. It doesn't appear that there's a lot of security being built into the smart grid. So <laughs> sounding like it's becoming the smart but windy grid. And then we've dissolved the uh, strategic grain reserve that we used to have during the Cold War. And so it seems like our ability to withstand food crises that could be a result of it makes all these things more urgent. Is there something at the local level that people can also do to complement these efforts at the national level, whether it's microgrids or local Correct. food, something yeah. or other, that we can become more resilient at the local level and so everyone can take part in this effort and not just let folks at Washington fix it for us? I, I think it's largely <clears throat> going to be a matter of state governance. And uh, you, can, you can't, it's sort of hard to do things city by city or county by county or whatever, but, but the state. Uh, know most state governments know their turf reasonably well and are positioned to get insurers and uh, and other businesses that are highly relevant to this and the utilities uh, uh, working uh, working together in public private partnerships I think the state state by state is probably the way uh, uh, the way to go Let Peter and Peter I want I have a question for you the severest critics of EMP threat, not from the sun, but nuclear, is that yield has to be in the megaton range. The weapon, therefore, is going to be very heavy and therefore can only be launched by an ICBM. Can you answer those? Sure. Those are, those are myths. And, uh, and I'm afraid a lot of those myths derive from my own work at the CIA, you know, some 20 years ago when we identified the preferred Soviet ICBM was the SS-18 Mod 1, which had a huge 25 megaton warhead on it. But they were going after our hardened, critical, you know, military critical infrastructures, which were hardened against EMP. And so they wanted to generate the strongest field strengths they could at that time. And also at that time, the technology of enhanced or super EMP weapons was not known. When you're talking about the civilian uh, critical infrastructures, the grid, communications, transportation systems, these have never been hardened against EMP. They're very soft targets. And we, uh, we, when the, one of the things the commission did is we took modern, technologies from all of these infrastructures. We put them in the EMP simulators and looked at the field strengths that were necessary. You know, they will fail at very low field strengths. The kind of, in fact, we could not come up with a yield, a low enough yield, where we said, well, you don't have to worry about weapons of this yield or below because the EMP isn't strong enough. Any nuclear weapon, any nuclear weapon, doesn't matter what the yield is. It doesn't have to be a super EMP weapon. Well, we'll, uh, at, 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 a, at a, basically at 30 kilometers altitude, you know, uh, you know, you uh, it, and you don't need a missile either. By the way, you know, you can take a meteorological balloon and get up to 30 kilometers with a crude first-generation weapon. And if you detonated that anywhere over the eastern seaboard, it would probably collapse the eastern grid that generates 70% of our electricity. So it's a really great 
catastrophic option for a low-tech adversary, low-tech where, you know, where nuclear is concerned. You know, so you don't even strictly need ballistic missiles to pull this off. And you don't need high-yield, sophisticated <laughs> weapons. Although those weapon, that kind of technology is clearly within the grasp. We think the North Koreans probably have the super. And if the North Koreans have got it, Iran is not going to be far behind because they're working together. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes, I think I'll direct this to Director Woolsey. Um, a little, little bit about attribution now. You were, you were talking about um, um, the, the fact that um, um, well, basically uh, we want to we want to see. If we, we've heard that the threats are, are North Korea and Iran, but I tend to think that the Russian Federation and the People's Republic of China are probably sponsoring them, and they're probably. Following Sun Tzu's uh, uh, concept of when you're weak, uh, when you're strong, pretend you're weak. Whereas uh, Iran and and, and uh, North Korea arguably would be doing the contrary. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm and also Japan. I'm, I'm wondering if you can really trust Japan because Japan is a cyber partner of ours. And and I'm also wondering whether or not the, the Russians and Chinese uh, they, they probably have a lot of their agents undercover as as business. So that if we heard, heard that Iran attacked us, they might say they were doing it for Allah, but they might actually be doing it for another power. Well, the problem with some of, with some of these areas, it's true for EMP, and it's uh, true uh, for cyber, and it could well be true for the folks who use the AK-47s on the Transformers uh, uh, in San Jose, uh, is that we are used to historically knowing who it was we were fighting. People wore uniforms, Japanese planes that attacked Pearl Harbor had big red moons on them. Uh, we, that was only a fringe problem for most of the 20th century wars uh, uh, of not knowing who you were dealing with and who they represented and why they had come against you. People actually still declared war back then. Uh, that's no longer the case. If you got an EMP, uh, a uh, shot from something coming around the South Pole. It first of all, you might not know it came around the South Pole because you might not have your radars uh, trained right. But you might not have the foggiest idea whether it was the North Koreans uh, or the uh, Iranians or or somebody else or of their motivation. And uh, uh, one has suppositions that the Chinese need us to buy their stuff, and so they're perhaps somewhat less likely to come try to knock us out. But it might depend on the circumstances, and it might depend on uh, what, uh, what you know, there are lots of possibilities in which you could have a, a serious threat of that sort from China. So this is, EMP is uh, just one, although it's an incredibly important one, is just one of the circumstances of modern hostilities and people, Hezbollah working with Lebanon and Hezbollah working with Syria and uh, uh, Sunni uh, guerrillas uh, 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 coming into the picture, are they Al-Qaeda or are they not? All of this is a mess and uh, we can't deal with all of it successfully. We got to take the things first and foremost, I think, that would really essentially take down our civilization. And I take my hat off to Peter and Hank and the folks at Bob and the folks who've been working on this a lot longer than I have for, for uh, Keeping zeroed in on this, and I think they're now starting to get some traction uh, in the uh, in the country uh, as a whole. But uh, these problems of uh, who's doing this and why uh, aren't going to go away. I'm afraid they're going to be with us for a long time. We got another few minutes to back very far back. I don't know of anything yet that's come up to me. No, the whole part of the whole point of this is that we're not doing anything about EMP even within this country, no. let alone working with our allies. Not yet. Okay. Well, I there, there were a couple of things I, I wanted to catch up on. I'm trying to keep up with all this. Um, they slipped my mind. I'll write them down. Come back. <laughs> I listened to the que questions and I. Peter, if you would, to address Pakistan. 
We'll close down here in about another five, ten minutes. Okay. Go ahead, Peter. Pakistan. Uh, I, I was told to announce that the parking garage closes at 7 o'clock if people ah. are parked in the parking garage. And so, you know, you've got to be aware of that. that would, anybody who's parked in the parking garage, feel free to wave at us as you leave. Otherwise, we'll keep going another few and minutes. So I missed the question about Pakistan. Pakistan. What, uh, what about it? I mean, here they have nuclear. And yes. it's a, a fragile regime. Do you see that as a major issue? I do see them as a potential uh, threat. They also uh, they've all they also have a close working relationship with North Korea. Their gory medium range ballistic missile is the North Korean Nodom, you know, which they just uh, souped up. And also because their regime is so unstable, you know, what if those weapons fell into the hands of the Taliban or of radicals within Pakistan? So they're also a concern. And there's one, although it will, people haven't asked this question, I don't want us to break up without this point, you know. Uh, the plan the commission came up with is, a, is what we call, call an all-hazard strategy. The, the, these, these, uh, this plan wouldn't just protect you against DMP, nuclear, natural. It would protect against all hazards, or at least mitigate them. For instance, the worst-case cyber scenario, where you use computer bugs and computer hacking to manipulate the SCADA systems, okay? change the way the electricity comes into the big transformers. Well, SCADA is supervisory control and data acquisition. It's the control systems. Yeah, really exactly. Really. If you had a surge arrestor to protect against the nuclear natural EMP in the rear, it would also protect against that because it doesn't care whether it's uh, an EMP or whether it's uh, a different waveform that's manipulated by, by computer cyber type bu bugs. Um, the uh, Faraday cage, which is just a big metal box that you could put around these big transformers, make it thick enough, in addition to protecting against DMP, it'll also stop rifle fire or rocket-propelled grenade launchers. Uh, it also would stop tree branches and trees that could get hurled about by tornadoes and hurricanes, which is the most common failure mode during these storms. So, you know, these are just sort of common sense things that you think the electric power industry would have done a long time ago just to protect against normal storms and things of that sort. Um, so these, so we're not just talking about EMP protection. If this small amount of money were spent, we'd be taking care of the whole range of all, uh, in, a, in an all hazards approach. And time for two more here and here, and we're going to call them. I was just wondering if you could comment on the, the payload that the North Korean satellite launched that went tumbling out of control supposedly at about 500 kilometers, tracks over the central uh, part of the United States to the east coast and back. Um, That's a 220. Yeah, yeah it watched. weighs 220 pounds. Right, but kilograms. It, the, so, the fact that it's supposedly tumbling out of control could potentially do some harm, especially at altitude. Well, I'm not sure if it were it detonated. Matter. It, it, it doesn't were, matter. If it's for detonated 100, 200, 300 miles up above, uh, uh, it, it if it, it it would send out a large EMP pulse, and whether or not well, it was. Totally devastating or not, it might depend on its size. Yeah, I'm not sure I understand your question. Are you saying because the satellite was tumbling that that would interfere with the no. EMP attack? No. That, well, I was, so that has been asked. Uh, it and, wouldn't. And no. It wouldn't make any difference. Right. The gamma rays propagate spherically, and so it wouldn't matter what the position of the satellite was. It would. Uh, and it still could be detonated, even though it's not. Yeah, sure. Put a timer on it. You know, uh, there are, uh, you'd probably have multiple using options for it, uh, you know. Uh, you know, you wouldn't need a radio signal and probably wouldn't use a radio signal or, or something like that. You just have it go off automatically. Hank, you get the last you word. You know, orbital mechanics, right? <laughs> right. Uh, there, were, there were two things, I thought, to tie together. First of all, on the Panamanian ship, whatever, the North Korean ship, at least I've seen reports that that same ship earlier this year was in China and in Russia, I right. think, to the point you were on. These, these folks play together. Um, and the question about the scenarios, uh, I talked with, I'm, I'm not going to give out names because I don't want to get anybody in particular trouble inside the bureaucracy about Peter's suggestion of including an EMP scenario, and I was told by a fairly senior official there that nobody pays any attention to the scenarios, and I was, it was suggested to me that what we needed was a national exercise on all this, and I said, I don't, I'm really not interested in a national exercise because Washington's dysfunctional, and I can't think of a more dysfunctional organization than DHS. But uh, I, 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 what about a regional one? And, and I'm very interested in pursuing that uh, with the National Guard and within Region 4 and the states surrounding that part of my own state, South Carolina. So. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.